Why don't we see the Ethiopian Bible being sold and read throughout the world? Why has it been banned and hidden so that Christians cannot read it? Until now, most people have not known about the Ethiopian Bible and its contents. However, the truth cannot be kept hidden for longer. People have tried everything to access and read it to know what secret knowledge it contains that other versions of the Bible do not talk about. But why do differences exist between the Bible read throughout the world and the Ethiopian Bible? What forbidden texts, verses, knowledge and orders does it contain that have led to its ban? Welcome and on. This episode, we will explain what forbidden knowledge the Ethiopian Bible contains that has got it banned, especially in the Western world. Let's get started. In contrast to the Bibles used in Western Christianity or the Jewish Tanakh, the Ethiopian Bible has a more extensive canon, including many books that were either omitted or overlooked in other Christian traditions. This becomes the major difference in the Ethiopian Bible and the other Bibles read throughout the world. Because the Ethiopian Bible has more information, even the sensitive one, it has been banned. However, it becomes quite hard to know the differences in the narratives especially because the Ethiopian Bible is not widely available. These texts are often seen as containing some of the most intriguing aspects of the religious narrative, with stories so profound and mysterious that they have the potential to reshape our understanding of early Judeo-Christian beliefs. Fundamentally, dating back to the early Christian era, the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church is one of the oldest Christian denominations globally. Its Bible reflects this ancient heritage, by preserving texts and interpretations that have been excluded or altered in other Christian traditions. Known as the Meshafei Kedus, or Holy Scriptures, the Ethiopian Bible was initially written in Geez, an ancient Ethiopian language that was the common language of the Ethiopian Church and the Aksumite Empire. The translation of the Bible into Geez is credited to the efforts of early missionaries and scholars who aimed to make the Scriptures accessible to the Ethiopian people. What makes the Ethiopian Bible unique among other Christian canons is its inclusion of several texts not found in Catholic or Orthodox canons, such as the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jubilees, and various other writings. These additional texts provide insights into the distinctive theological perspectives of the Ethiopian Church and its historical connections to Jewish traditions. As the primary custodian of this Bible, the Ethiopian Orthodox Tiwa Hedo Church considers these additional books integral to its canon, reflecting the Church's historical isolation and distinct religious identity, relatively uninfluenced by theological debates in the Roman Empire. The manuscripts of the Ethiopian Bible are renowned for their detailed designs, vivid illustrations, and elaborate bindings, showcasing the rich artistic traditions of Ethiopia and the deep blend of religious art with spiritual expression. Crafted using indigenous materials such as vellum from goat or sheepskin and natural dyes for illustrations, the Ethiopian Bible is a testament to the exceptional skill and labour-intensive process involved in its creation. Despite not being part of Jewish or most Christian canons, the Book of Enoch holds a significant place in the Ethiopian Bible. It offers enchanting insights into religious history through its content, themes and historical context contributing to a deeper understanding of early Jewish apocalypticism and its influence on Christian eschatology. In Christian theology, the portrayal of the Son of Man in the Book of Enoch holds significant importance. This text is filled with themes of divine judgment, angelology, and eschatology. Despite its impact, the Book of Enoch was eventually left out of both the Jewish canon and most Christian Bibles. However, its preservation within the Ethiopian Church shows the diverse nature of early Christian literature and theology. The Book of Enoch has fascinated scholars and theologians because of its detailed depictions of otherworldly realms, complicated angelology and apocalyptic visions, sparking debates about its origins and significance. The initial contact between the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and European Christianity dates back to the early Middle Ages, but it was limited and did not lead to a thorough understanding of the Ethiopian Christian tradition. It wasn't until the increased European exploration and missionary efforts in Africa during the 18th and 19th centuries that the Ethiopian Bible and its unique canon caught the attention of Western scholars. The examination of the Book of Enoch and other Ethiopian texts 
contributed to a re-evaluation of early Jewish and Christian literature, highlighting the diversity of religious thought in the early Christian centuries. Within the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, the Book of Enoch isn't just an ancient artifact but an integral part of their scripture, shaping Ethiopian Christian beliefs and practices. Another significant work found in the Ethiopian Bible is the Book of Baruch, which explores profound theological themes such as divine justice, theodicy, and eschatology. This broader canon offers a more comprehensive understanding of the early Judeo-Christian worldview. Additionally, the ascension of Isaiah, included in the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church's extensive biblical canon, blends elements of Jewish and Christian apocalyptic literature, providing vivid depictions of celestial journeys and theological reflections. The ascension of Isaiah is commonly split into two main sections, the martyrdom of Isaiah and the vision of Isaiah. The martyrdom part, which leans towards Jewish themes, recounts the persecution and death of the prophet Isaiah during the reign of King Manasseh of Judah. In contrast, the vision segment provides a notably Christian perspective, detailing Isaiah's journey through the seven heavens guided by an angel. Throughout the vision of Isaiah, the prophet ascends through various levels of heaven, encountering different angelic beings and witnessing the worship and praise given to God by these celestial inhabitants. The descriptions of the heavens are rich in symbolic detail, reflecting both Jewish and early Christian cosmological beliefs. The ascension of Isaiah explores theological themes central to both Jewish and Christian apocalyptic literature. One significant theme is the contrast between the corruption of the earthly realm and the purity of the heavenly realms, underlining the eschatological message of God's kingdom triumphing over earthly powers. Another central theme is the portrayal of the Messiah, interpreted in Christian contexts as a prophecy of Jesus Christ's incarnation, crucifixion and ascension, linking the ascension of Isaiah with New Testament thought. Thought to have been composed between the late 1st and early 2nd centuries AD, the ascension of Isaiah reflects the interactions and tensions between emerging Christian communities and traditional Jewish groups during that period. For scholars, the text serves as a valuable source for studying the development of Jewish and Christian apocalyptic thought, providing insights into how early Christian writers adapted Jewish ideas. This is what the widely read Bible avoids talking about. Another section that the Ethiopian Bible includes, but other Bibles don't, is the Book of Jubilees. It is an ancient Jewish religious work believed to have been written in the 2nd century BCE. Interestingly, it retells stories from Genesis and Exodus, with expansions, interpretations and additional details, emphasising observance of the Sabbath, dietary laws, circumcision and angelology. In the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church, the Book of Jubilees holds significance, influencing Ethiopian Christian thought through its detailed chronology of biblical events and emphasis on law and observance. Another notable text, the Kebra Nagast or the Glory of Kings, while not strictly part of the Ethiopian Bible in canonical terms, holds a pivotal place within the Ethiopian Christian tradition. This work blends biblical narrative, apocalyptic literature and national mythology, narrating the legendary origins of the Solomonic line of Ethiopian kings and forming a crucial component of Ethiopian cultural and religious identity. The Kebra Nagast holds deep significance beyond its role as a religious text among Ethiopians. It is a cornerstone of their national identity and historical narrative. This epic weaves together a blend of legends, scriptures and oral traditions, merging Jewish and Christian sources with Ethiopian folklore. It begins with the well-known tale of the Queen of Sheba's visit to King Solomon in Jerusalem, a story familiar from the Bible. However, the Kebra Nagast expands upon this narrative, talking about a romantic love affair between Solomon and the Queen, resulting in the birth of their son, Menelik. Subsequently, Menelik journeys to Jerusalem, where he receives recognition from Solomon before returning to Ethiopia with the Ark of the Covenant. At the heart of the Kebra Nagast lies the story of how the Ark made its way to Ethiopia. According to the text, Menelik, accompanied by numerous Israelites, covertly transports the Ark to Ethiopia. Its presence in Ethiopia serves as a symbol of divine favour, legitimising the reign of the Solomonic dynasty. 
This narrative carries profound religious and cultural significance for Ethiopians, instilling a sense of pride and spiritual identity among Ethiopian Christians. Furthermore, it has captured the interest of historians, theologians, and adventurers worldwide, sparking fascination and speculation about its historical and mystical implications. Notably, the Kebra Nagast not only links Ethiopian history to the biblical saga of Solomon, but also asserts Ethiopian rulers as direct descendants of this biblical figure. This lineage to Solomon and the Davidic line provides both a religious and historical foundation for the legitimacy of the Ethiopian monarchy, a claim upheld until Emperor Haile Selassie's downfall in 1974. However, the Bibles in the Western world do not want to recognize that. The portrayal of the Queen of Sheba known as Makeda in Ethiopian tradition is also significant, depicting her as a wise and influential ruler. Her encounter with Solomon is considered a pivotal moment in Ethiopia's spiritual history, elevating Ethiopia's stature within the broader Judeo-Christian narrative. The use of Ge'ez, an ancient Semitic language, plays a fundamental role in both the Ethiopian Bible and the Kebra Nagast. Although no longer spoken in daily life, Ge'ez is preserved in liturgical and scholarly contexts, like Latin in the Roman Catholic Church or Classical Hebrew in Judaism. Its preservation in religious practice has been essential in maintaining the continuity of Ethiopian Christian tradition. However, the complexities of Ge'ez pose challenges for translation and interpretation, affecting how the Ethiopian Bible is understood both within Ethiopia and globally. Despite these challenges, the translation and study of the Ethiopian Bible offer valuable opportunities for scholars and believers alike. For scholars, it provides insights into early Christianity, Jewish-Christian relations, and the evolution of religious thought. For the Ethiopian Orthodox community, translations into more accessible languages can broaden access to their scripture. The Ethiopian Bible has faced bans because it contains several books not found in the Protestant Bible. These additional texts, often referred to as the deuterocanonical or apocryphal books, offer unique perspectives on religious teachings, history and morality. Because these texts present narratives and ideas differing from mainstream Western religious traditions, the West chose to ban the Ethiopian Bible altogether. Throughout colonial periods, or under Western influence, efforts have been made to suppress or discredit non-Western religious texts, including those within the Ethiopian Bible. These attempts may arise from various motives, such as asserting cultural or religious dominance and controlling indigenous belief systems. What's more, it's done to disconnect the Ethiopian community from a direct link with biblical figures. Some scholars and researchers argue that certain teachings within the Ethiopian Bible challenge prevailing Western ideologies or power structures. For example, the detailed descriptions of heavenly realms and divine beings in the Book of Enoch offer alternative cosmologies, divergent from Western-centric views of the universe. This leaves the West with two choices. Acknowledge that they compiled a biased Bible excluding the parts that did not benefit them, or ban the Ethiopian Bible that tells the truth. The West chose the second option. Have you ever heard or seen the original Ethiopian Bible which presents a whole different picture of Christianity? What, in your opinion, is the reason they have banned the Ethiopian Bible? Let us know in the comment section below. If you would like to read the Ethiopian Bible to understand how you have been deprived of this important knowledge, do you want to watch more videos like this one? Thanks for watching. Until next time, stay stoic.